So apparently it all started with a gearbox. In the National Archives, there is a very, very thick file, it's about 150 odd pages, and it seems to be the best overall documentation in the archives that I found of the development of any armored vehicle. Not necessarily the most complete and thorough, but it's kind of like from the very beginning to the very end, selected portions in one binder. And the very first letter on it is a letter from Ordnance Department to J.S. Cunningham and Sons of New York, Rochester as I recall, asking, we are looking to build a new tank. Would you mind awfully building us the gearbox? And somehow things developed from there to Cunningham building the T1 light tank. The T1 was a program started about 1926. Uh, the Army, of course, had only until then basically World War I offshoots, the M1917s, a couple of the Ford three tons, and a few of the Mark VIII Liberties. They made the 1921 and 1922, and then a little bit later the 1928, three medium tanks, and that was it. So they decided it was about time they built a new tank and they put the request out there that they decided after a little while that perhaps a front engine vehicle was going to be the best idea. And eventually the T1 light tank showed up for testing. And ordnance looked upon the work and thought it was good. And so they developed the T1E1. And they looked upon that and they thought, you know, we could still do better. And thus they developed the T1E2. Now, compared to the earlier T1s and T1E1s, this is definitely different. A different gun, different engine, different armor, different tracks. But it is basically the oldest thing we still have. So we will start our American story there. Yes, I get it. There is the M1921. There's a couple of three tons and so on that are out there. But for the, the new generation of tanks in the interwar period for the U.S. Army, which include the T2 medium, this is where we can start. So let's see what we got. So starting as ever at the front, well, we got our five eighths of an inch thick of front plate, which as you can see comes down and has been bent part way to start with an under slope. Uh, the slope on the top is, looks about a quarter inch, goes all the way obviously up to the driver's vision port. You can see access for the hand crank if you have to hand crank it, a towing hook. And then of course we get to the air outtake the air intake is up top, and a radiator, a traditional old-fashioned radiator at the front. Huh. So it looks like what we have is an armor plate uh, which is removable in order to access the radiator underneath. Now, we don't normally talk about the engine this early in the tour, but because it is a front engine vehicle, why not? Uh, there are two very nice, easy to open louvers. Unfortunately, they have welded them shut. Now, somebody's taken an angle grinder and tried to unweld them. Uh, it didn't do a great job, and we tried with a pry bar. We can't get it open, and maybe we could, but we don't want to break it doing it, so we're going to leave that for the mechanics to, to deal with at some future point. Now, we can actually see the engine from the inside, so it's not a total waste. But I'll just mention it now. Anyway, it is a Cunningham-designed liquid-cooled V8, puts out 132 horsepower. Other than that, well, the tracks. Well, the tracks have gone from 12 inches in width on the earlier tanks to now 13 inches in width. And as you can see, they are, a, again, as you would expect from the era, a very simple cast metal design. You will note there is a flange for the wheels. So there's no center guides. Uh, what keeps the tracks on are flanges on the wheels, uh, both the idler and the road wheels down below. Now, one of the reasons I really like filming these older vehicles is that they date back to a time before anybody knew how to design a tank. So there's all sorts of different theories and ideas being thrown out there. I mean, these days, it's pretty, the fundamentals are pretty much figured out, but not so much in the 1920s. So what we have here by way of suspension 
is you can see the idler wheel, and here's another great view of that flange I was talking about, is mounted on large springs. This is what will keep our track tension tensioned. And you can see there's a, a guide shaft on each side for the idler wheel to slide backwards and forwards. Now, there's, near as I can tell, there will be two reasons to have such a spring. One is, well, obviously, as I say, for track tension. The other is, well, cleverly enough, the track is the furthermost forward piece of the vehicle, which means that it could impact walls or other things that will have to scale vertically. And that initial impact is going to be fairly jarring. So why not have a spring to help absorb some of the blow? Well, then when you come down to the wheels themselves, the road wheels, uh, and they look very similar to these return rollers up here, again, with the flange, is you'll see they're mounted in pairs. They're not sprung. They're, they're, they're literally little bogies with a kind of a link suspension above them. I'll, I'll put an inset in from Honeycutt. And, well, the ride would have been kind of ugly. Unfortunately, that's... Uh, Pretty common, though, with some of the earlier vehicles. And you can see how the track pins are kept in place by a cotter pin. So unlike a lot of cotter pins which go through the, uh, through the track pin itself, what they have here is that the track pin has a hammerhead uh, and the cotter pin keeps the hammerhead in place at the end so it doesn't go through the pin it goes at the end of the pin and it uh, goes up into the track link uh, so to pull the track you pull the cotter pin out and then the hammerhead will come out that way exhaust pipe goes under the fender all the way to the rear well there are arguments for and against on that one at least at the lower speeds that this vehicle will crawl at and then when you get to the back do you have the sprocket wheel so obviously this is a transmission uh, at uh, the engine at the front and then the, the driver is at the back. So you still have to have the drive shaft going all the way down the tank, even though it's a front engine tank. Again, it's just a matter of the amount of room that you have in the vehicle and the amount of balance that you have. This is probably the earliest mud scraper I can think of offhand. Now I'm going to go have a look at the FT around the corner now in a second. And if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, but uh, they're thinking fairly ahead here. Uh, but this bucket, of course, is unsprung as well. So some access panels here for uh, accessing some of the suspension, but you cannot access all of the suspension through these rivets, uh, correction, bolts here. And you'll also note that a lot of the vehicle is actually riveted. They're not bolts. They're not designed to come apart for repair or replacement or anything else like that. So if you do have to pull a plate, you're basically going after it with an oxy torch. Fuel tanks are mounted on the Sponson sides. And then again, more riveting, pistol port. And well, I'm going to have a look inside, but we were mucking around with this a little bit earlier. And I strongly suspect that this lid here is literally just resting on there by weight of gravity alone. There is a hatch uh, inside the, the a little rectangular hatch we'll show you in a second. So uh, that's about it. You'll see that the driver's uh, box, vision box, can open in all sides as well as forward. So he can open his front hatch and he has a good uh, 180 degree field of vision. Not bad. Of course, the vision for the commanders, uh, other than these little pistol ports, are these tiny little vision slits. Commander, gunner, whatever you want to call them. Um, not ideal. I'm just going to quickly skip to the far side uh, just to, to show one or two items. Firstly, yes, there is another fuel tank here. Yes, there is another exhaust pipe here. I have absolutely no idea what this thing's function is. It is not on any of the period photographs. Uh, obviously, right now, they just put the item tag number on this. 77092 CSAM's Central Control Number. Well, you saw that painted on the far side, so now I'm going to go again and look up to see what the serial number is on the actual photographs. I suspect it wasn't on at the time, and it's just a uh, center for military history control tag now. The two posts at the front, by the way, those are headlights. 
or at least they would be mountable for headlights, judging from the photos of the earlier T1E1 and T1. Uh, the photographs of Honeycutt of this particular vehicle don't show headlights mounted, they just show the empty posts as they are now. One other thing uh, to note on the back side here, you can see what happens when one of these cotter pins fails. It just gouges the plate on the side. So eventually what would happen is uh, there would simply gouge a hole in the plate, which is very unfortunate, uh, but it's the same principle you can see in later vehicles like the T-34 where you have the ramp instead specifically designed to hit pins that have worked their way loose. I guess the, the, that might be one reason why the cotter pin idea didn't hold uh, and just bash them back into place before they can do any damage to the whole integrity of the vehicle. You know, this, this is an important part of the vehicle holding it together. And finally, of course, the, the mud chutes, very common in pre-war tanks. So the thinking is that the, lots of mud would come along the return run. It will be shaking over the return rollers. It would be falling down. And instead of falling down back into the suspension, it will bounce off and be shoved off to the side. Now the problem with it though is on the inside if you get all sorts of uh, liquids or materials that get sucked up into the skirting then you just made life a lot worse for the suspension down below not better which is why you yeah, don't see it much on later vehicles and you certainly don't see it on fast vehicles. Uh, besides it also eats up a lot of the space that will be used in later suspension for the wheels to actually move. Anyway, back to the back. And so we come to the back of the vehicle. 1945-0125. What were they doing with this tank in January of 1945? Interesting. Uh, you can also see down here in the tracks how thin some of this casting is because it's already rusted all the way through. Either that or some stones or whatever helped make holes. But as you move over, we can see, well, yeah, they have actually did have taillights, one on the other side as well. Um, this piece of rubber, again, remember I said that this was being held on simply by weight of gravity? Well, when they're shipping this thing around to stop the thing rattling, what they've done is they've put these rubber pads underneath and then they put big tie downs, the uh, uh, this, this sort of little metal band tie downs that you have to cut. Uh, so we just cut them off this morning, uh, but we're still not lifting this up and that's why we still have these protective rubber flaps in place. So they weren't part of the real vehicle, obviously. Uh, they're just a reality of transporting museum pieces. They were nice enough to put a swing door, uh, two opening panels with, again, a little pistol port at the back. This side is completely frozen. This side is mostly frozen. And we can see inside. Before we do, though, I'll just mention a couple of points here for the uh, towing hooks. You'll see that the drive wheels, they the axles only go this far in. They don't need to go any further because the drive comes in from further forward. And looking inside, it's actually kind of civilized. So you, you expect a level of basicness for a World War I-ish tank. And remember, this is built by a luxury coach builder. And it looks like it's actually been well built. So let's go inside. Okay, I am now inside a tank that is 90, oh, 94 years old. That's older than me. Look at this gray hair. All right, so I am in the commander goodness position. It's, I have a, a formed seat. It's on the ground. I mean, it, it's solidly attached. I'm sitting astride the transmission, which goes directly underneath me. Behind me are going to be uh, the linkages for the steering, it's a clutch brake, very simple old-fashioned clutch brake steering, nothing not too amazing. And you will see quite a few rounds of 37mm. Uh, maybe after the fact I'll actually count them, 
Uh, but for now, they're just stowed on both sides, and they're pretty solid racks, in fairness. Now, again, the 37mm that is used in the Browning Automatic uh, 37, semi-automatic in reality, uh, is not the same 37 as found on the M3 anti-tank gun. So don't expect the same level of performance, even though the gun is a long, uh, long gun. Uh, coax would be a 30 cal, uh, okay, fair enough. Now, something that I like is the fact that they have a, an actual traverse handle and gear. This is a geared turret. A lot of the one-man turrets of the interwar and early period were you simply hoisted yourself around with muscle power, and I'm happy to say that is not the case here. Uh, mount, well, there's not much left of the, of the mount, I'm afraid to say, or the aiming system, although you will see that although there is the mount up here for the 37, uh, correction, the 30 cal, there is an optic mount located parallel on the left. There is a single rectangular hatch in here, um, and we can't get it open. Any attempts that we have made to try to open it have simply tried to lift the entire turret roof, which we decided was probably going a bit too far, so we're not going to do that. Machine gun ammunition is on the right-hand side. I'm looking at this hook here. This almost looks like the, the sort of hook that would be used by a sling back in the day. Uh, but I don't see... Oh, here's, here's the other hook over here. So I guess it would be possible, if you wanted to ride head out, that you could put a sling seat here, like in, let's say, 1917, or a Humvee gunner, and you could ride on the sling, head out, and you'd be comfortable as you're bouncing around across the country. Obviously, this seat here does not raise and lower particularly much, if at all, and is used only uh, for head down, hatch close operation. Uh, in terms of vision, as I said, he's got a couple of slits, vision slits around the side. Uh, there do seem to be safety glasses. Uh, well, this one doesn't have anything at all. And I can see nothing. Yeah, good luck trying to fight a battle looking at those things. I have no doubt that the pistol ports are far more used, even if it does increase vulnerability. All right, let's, uh, let's move forward. So one item of note, as I'm looking at the machine gun stowage, ordinarily we look at machine gun stowage and we think rails for boxes. Well, it looks here what we have are long shoots with hooks that you hook the ammo belts onto, and it is a pure belt fed, and you just take the belt off the hook and you feed it into the machine gun. Okay, so now I have wormed my way forward. Uh, first conclusion, I cannot drive this vehicle. Uh, now, it, it seems like you need to have a very special combination of, uh, of length that's not too high and not too tall, because as you can see, the pedals are on the extreme outer edges of the hull sides. Uh, the brake and the accelerator are way out on the right, and the clutch is way out on the left. And in my case, my primary problem is going to be the tiller, although I see the air filter is here as well. You will notice that the engine is directly to my front with apparently no firewall, uh, which cannot say good things probably for getting burned or anything else. Uh, the steering is conducted by this, so this crossbar tiller, so you can push and pull that way. Fairly nice uh, if you can do it. And the steering, uh, correction, gear shift on the right appears to be a three-speed transmission, three forward, one in reverse. On the right, our panels are oil. I've, one is empty, I couldn't tell you. I know it's illuminated, so you can see it in the dark, little electric bulbs. Um, no idea. I think it's a speedometer. I think it's a ribbon speedometer. Uh, and then your control. So there's no rev counter. So I guess you'd have to change gear by ear. Uh, the seat is a comfortable seat if you fit on it, which as I say, I do not. Um, for vision, well, it's got the, the small little vision slits. Uh, but as I say, there are dead bolts here. You can pull the dead bolts. Uh, lift them up and then you get a full 180 degree field vision when you are not in combat conditions, which of course this vehicle never was. I don't know if there's very much else to say about this vehicle. Ouch, that hurt. 
um, to the fuel selector perhaps for the for the two fuel tanks. Just looking at where the wire is traced. Uh, the engine, as I say, is the V8 liquid cooled. They put a tarp on it. Somebody was nice enough to put a tarp on the top when this thing was out in the open. So the engine is not as deteriorated as you might think. Uh, unfortunately, they did such a good job of putting the plastic tarp on, we can't get it off. So, oh well. Uh, that's pretty much it for this seat. Uh, so now, shortly after having wormed my way in, I shall worm my way out. But again, it, it is so worth doing this. Uh, I mean, your Honeycutt books or anything else are not going to show you what it actually was like. So, even at the sacrifice of my clothing, <laughs> it's worth it. All right, let's get out of here. And my head. Now, of course, there were increased developments. The next version of the T1 actually had suspension that was sprung and doubtless the right was a whole lot better. Uh, but uh, although later developments like the T2 Medium, which was also built by Cunningham, did take cues from the T1, all in all it was a bit of a dead end and the army would go in other directions, especially once the Christie tank showed up maybe two years later. So that's it, a pretty small video for a pretty small vehicle that's also relatively incomplete. But when you're dealing with things that are this old and this rare, you take what you can get. And ever since I saw this thing for the first time, it was uh, the other end of uh, the base. They were, they were still housed in tents before they built this building. I knew I wanted to come back and look at this because it, it, this particular vehicle has always fascinated me, being at the leading edge of the, the development of not only the next generation of tank, but also the next generation of tank doctrine trying to figure out what we're going to do with it. So as ever, thanks to the Patreons and those who have bought merchandise and just donated on PayPal or YouTube to allow me the funding to get out here and do this. And also, of course, to the US Army's Ordnance Collection. I'm at the training support facility, newly built, as I say, in Fort Lee, Virginia. Not open to the public, I'm sorry, but if you have business on Fort Lee, I'm sure you can knock on the door and hope for the best. If not, they've got big windows you can look in. All right. Take care. I'll talk to you on the next one. There really isn't very much to say about this, all things considered. So after having wormed my way in, now I get to worm my way out again. Joy. All right. It would also help if, I, if, if it was recording. Push the red button, please. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now I have wormed my way forward. Uh, first conclusion, I cannot drive this vehicle. Uh, underneath is a Cunningham V8. Puts out about 140 horsepower. I need to check.